So hello, um, my name is Christian, um, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is like my fourth or my fifth EuroPython. Who is attending EuroPython for the first time? Raise your hand. Oh, that's a lot. Well, welcome to EuroPython. Um, who is also vegetarian or vegan here? Okay, we can do better. Um, <laughs> so, do you do you know this guy? It's really famous. Um, so this guy is uh, Mark Andresen. He's a venture capitalist in San Francisco. He's one of the most famous ones. Uh, he's also the co-author of Mosaic, the first browser, and he's also the co-founder of Netscape. And a couple of years ago, he wrote a really interesting article on the Wall Street Journal um, with the title, Why Software is Eating the World. Um, this is the blog post. This is the article on the Wall Street Journal. It's really interesting. Um, and the article tried to explain why software is reshaping the world and also changing our lives at the same time. Um, but today I would like to take this sentence and rephrase it a bit. So can software feed the world? But before answering this question, I have another one. Why should we bother? So does anyone know today's world's population? By any chance? Six? Sorry? Seven? Okay. It's 7.7 .7 billion. And by 2015, sorry, 2050? Oh, not 20. I mean, that will be really a lot. It's 9.8 billion. This um, is like the forecast from uh, the United Nations. And 9.8 billion, it's, it's a huge number. Um, I mean, it will put a lot of pressure on our ecosystem as a world. And to feed the world population by 2050, uh, we need to increase crops production by at least 25 or 70 percent, which is almost impossible. But I mean, that's not the only big change. Um, what about people living in urban areas? Uh, what part of the world population is living in urban areas right now? Well, that number today is 53 percent, and also by 2050 it will reach 68%. So the majority of the world population will live in big agglomerate in big cities uh, with more than, I don't know, 10 million people. So if you do the math, you see that there will be more than 4 billion people living in urban areas. And the question is, can we keep moving food around? Um, can, we can we keep producing food far from the consumers? So if we collect all these things together and we stop a second and we start thinking about the bigger picture, um, we can easily realize that we have some big problems. So first of all, um, the growth of the world population and also the migration towards urban areas are creating problems and putting also constraints at the same time. Uh, the first thing is, yes, we want to feed these people and we want to avoid hunger, uh, but it's, it's almost impossible to convert more land to food production uh, actually would be counterproductive because of the climate change, for example. And another thing that we need to consider is that people from developing countries are getting wealthier, uh, which means they will have a diet which is more similar to our right now. So the food consumption will increase and also change will evolve. So what should we do? Um, we have problems. We are engineer developers. Uh, how do we fix them? So many solutions have been proposed, uh, but we can summarize them in three main categories. So the first one is, um, I would like to invite you to change your diet, because moving from a, a heavy a red meat-based diet to a more sustainable one is the first change that we need to make. Uh, and this will reduce uh, crop lands to, to feed animals, which is one of the biggest problems right now. The second thing is that um, we should also reduce waste. I will talk more about this later, but just to give you a number, between 35 and 50% of the food is waste be before it gets to our tables. And the last thing that we can do or something that we can use is to use technology. And we can use technology for many things, but for example, we can use technology to increase crop yields or to rethink about agriculture. And that's what we do at Infra. So what you see here is it's not a fridge, it's not a container, it's a farm, it's a vertical farm. And we grow food, uh, we grow food inside here. Um, 
in farm is, is a fuss. It's not function as a service. It's farming as a service. It's a company uh, which was founded in Berlin um, a couple of years ago. And what you see here, like I said before, it's a vertical farm. And it's inside a retailer. Um, this is Edeka. It's the main retailer in, in Germany. And just to give you a number, we produce about uh, 110k plants every month just for Edeka. So the farm that you see here, it's, it's a long, um, it was a long process, like a long also, uh, it, it probably took like more than two years to develop like this, this concept of farm. And we can grow 35 different type of crops inside the farm locally. So we just work in this way. So we have production center close to the cities, in this case, Berlin. Um, we use zero pesticides because we can control the environment and we have no seasons. So we can produce 360 days. And currently we operate about 400 farms with the goal of reaching 1,000 by the end of the year. Um, just to give you, this is like a short video, it's like 30 seconds, and this is like inside a farm. So you can see the LED lights, um, people are operating the farms, they are also harvesting. Uh, we, we do the same inside the grocery shops. And then you can take your fresh herd directly from the point of sales. And what you see here is um, it's a mass production farm, this one. And it's the one that we use uh, inside, our, inside our production centers. So just to give you more context, uh, from the seeding phase to the harvest, it takes about four weeks. So in one month, more or less, we can grow um, almost everything. And a farm is a really, really complex living system uh, that we want to operate, we want to control, and also we want to monitor. So what can we control inside a farm? Um, so we have different things. We can control water, uh, hair control, lights control, also pH control, which is fundamental, and fertilizers. And like I said before, we need to do this at scale because we are operating about 400 farms with the goal of reaching 1,000 uh, in multiple locations because we are active in Germany, Switzerland, Luxembourg, UK, and we're going to expand to USA soon. And because this is a Python conference, guess what? We use Python. So as a software team, we have about four areas of focus. We have what we call operation, which is managing people doing uh, their kind of operation on the farms. Uh, then we have farm control, um, monitoring and alerting, and the new one, the last pillar, is called plants quality. So operation are all the activities related to um, seeding, planting, harvesting, maintenance, and um, it's the labor intensive part of managing a farm. Uh, farm control is, like I said, they are IoT device. So we have a configuration that we need to apply to each farm uh, because we want to control different parameters. Side. We want to control the lights, we want to control the water level. And a collection of these parameters is what we call recipe. So a recipe is something that we apply to a farm, is a set of configuration, and we use a, pro a provider that's called Particle, um, and we communicate with their API, and we send the configuration to the farms. Um, monitoring and alerting, it's, it's really interesting. Um, a farm under the hood is, is a really complex IoT system, also expensive, and we constantly receive events and data coming from the farms. So for example, if there is no water, that's, that's a huge problem. Uh, is the pH too high? That's also a big problem. So monitoring and alerting uh, is, is a fundamental part of our company right now. We have like a monitoring room. And we have this new pillar which is called uh, plants quality. And the idea is to use data science and artificial intelligence to increase um, crops quality and yield. So now I want to talk a bit more about the past of um, InFarm. So when we started, uh, we thought about building a product for home consumers. So as a consumer, you can buy our small farm and you can uh, bring the farm to your place and you can just grow things inside your apartment. But it, in the last like 12 months, uh, the scope of the company changed completely. So we had to pivot and from business to consumer, we changed it to business to business. So the software that we built, uh, 
has had to change it as well. So initially we had a really small team. The software team was, was less than five people. Um, we started with a Flask application with a big monolith. Um, all the business logic related to operation, farm control, and monitoring and alerting were inside this Flask application. And for job scheduling, we heavily rely on, um, on salary. Um, and as soon as our business model changed, uh, we started having issues. Um, we had scalability issues. Um, we had too many unmaintained dependencies. Uh, especially, I mean, Flask is really nice, but as soon as you t try to transform it to um, more um, Django ap application, uh, you start to rely on too many uh, external dependencies. Um, another thing is uh, because we are a startup and we, we are still trying to understand what is uh, our real business model. Uh, we had a, like an improper <coughs> leaky abstraction on top of our business model. And another thing which is really easy when you write Python application is that we were too much normalized to the business logic and everything else was defined inside the, the models. And that's what I consider our technical depth right now. So, as we start to grow, one of the things that we, we have seen was the application wasn't uh, providing us the right flexibility, especially because we're growing uh, and we want to be more flexible. Um, like I said, we, were, we are still depending on too many uh, unmaintained um, Flask plugins. Uh, and we don't have a really strict and well-defined boundaries uh, between the main models, and that's pretty bad also. And the application is currently running on Heroku, which was really good at the beginning. Uh, but we started to see that uh, the lack of running on containers was a problem because we couldn't make like each build really reproducible. Uh, Heroku is really nice, it's also really expensive and not really flexible. Um, so it's super okay if you just want to run your application from GitHub, but as soon as, soon as you have more complex like use cases and you want to be more flexible, that's, that's painful. And also, um, I joined like the company at the beginning of the year, and we had like no metrics, no logs. So every time that you wanted to debug something was really painful. Um, and like I said at the beginning, the application was also uh, providing monitoring and alerting, which means we were doing uh, data ingestion in directly in the Flask application, uh, like receiving thousands of events every second, which was killing uh, our performances because we were using just one database. And for a reason that I can hardly understand, we decided to try all the cloud providers. So if you name one, uh, we were using it. Uh, so we were running on Heroku, uh, the front app was running on DigitalOcean, and then we decided to try AWS, and why not also GCP? So we had to manage all, like our entire stack on four different cloud providers. So we decided to evolve, to grow, and we decided to do that on four different levels. So we decided to consolidate, uh, to work on the consolidation of our platform, uh, on the architecture, on being more cloud native, and on the concept of observability. So consolidate. The first thing was to deprecate all the cloud providers and move to GCP. So we made this decision. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, migrate from Heroku to GCP. We're going to migrate from Digital Ocean to also GCP. And the same for AWS. And then we decided to pay technical debt. So uh, as a software team, we can allocate about 25% of our time to work on these things and to try to reduce the technical debt. Um, have you ever heard about the 10x developer? Yes, no? It's a normal develop 10x developer. So it's, it's just a developer who uses linters. So you should use linters as well. Uh, in the Python community, we have many different. So please check Flack8, Isort, Black, and MyPy. Uh, they are extremely useful, especially if you're like a small team and you want to be fast and you want to integrate these things with your CI CD. And the last point about consolidate is about build versus buy and unmanage versus manage. So we made a clear decision on, okay, we are not to build anything that, which is not crucial or fundamental for our business, and the same for using only managed services. So everything we run 
you can think about Kubernetes is everything managed. Same for the databases, the same for um, Redis. Um, the only thing that we run is, is, is nothing actually, because we also use Influx as a service, uh, Grafana as a service, so everything. Um, another thing, especially about technical debt, which is extremely important, uh, is we started to hear things like, we cannot build that features because it's too hard or it will take too much time. And for a startup, which, which is like in a growing phase, that's extremely, that's, that's, it's like killing the innovation inside the company. So um, we decided to really put more time and effort into this. And like I said, I mean, I, I especially love linters. They're extremely useful. Uh, you, you take like one or two hours to configure them and then they're um, ready to run. And they're really easy to integrate with your CI or CD pipeline. And I mean, then you don't, then you don't have to worry about the formatting of your Python code. Um, if you want to put a comma or if you like to have, I don't know, 80 chars or something else. And the next point is about architecture. So we started with a monolith application and we started to realize that it was extremely hard to work on this application. Uh, it was too big, too hard. Um, and you started to have uh, silos. Um, one of the, like the next step that we want to achieve inside Inform is to move from a service-oriented architect, sorry, to move from a monolith application to a service-oriented ar uh, architecture. We would like to have a more strict um, service separation, which means um, we want to remove from what we call the compost application all the parts that are related to farm control, because that's a service. Uh, monitoring and alerting is just something um, separated. And we want to keep moving into this direction. And related to monitoring and alerting, uh, something that we just recently completed was uh, to move data ingestion from uh, the Flask application to cloud functions. And specifically about monitoring and alerting, we are not just doing data ingestion using cloud function, uh, but we also build um, dashboard directly on demand depending on the farm. So every time that we install a new farm or we change the recipe of, of a farm, the parameter inside the farm, they, they change. Uh, which means that we need to have new alerting, uh, like levels, uh, new messages, and all these things. And especially during the summer or between the summer and the winter, uh, the recipe of a farm change change many times. And using cloud function, um, using a smart cloud function, we can make the dashboard reactive. So we can provision new dashboard using Grafana, and we can set new levels of um, alerting. And we are using uh, Python 3.7 for everything. Uh, this is a blog announcement from um, the Google Cloud um, DevRel. Um, this was about an announcing the general, uh, general availability of cloud function with Python with 3.7, which is extremely nice. And there is a mention about what we are doing there. What about cloud native? Uh, have you heard about this concept before? Raise your hand. No, I'm the only one. Okay, a couple of people. Okay, um, so the first thing was to migrate to containers. So also inside Roku, we are running containers, uh, which is somehow nice because then you can also run containers on your machine and it's everything more uh, reproducible. But it's just painful to run containers in just Roku in Roku because uh, the platform was, was thought with a different uh, use case in mind. We decided to introduce also infrastructure as code as a part of our migration from uh, Roku to Kubernetes. And now every build inside our CI CD, uh, whether it's a PR or something master, is a Docker image. And I'm, I'm leading the migration uh, to Kubernetes. I gave like a workshop on Monday and we are using Jiki, which is the managed platform by, uh, by Google. So what about observability? Have you heard about this concept before? Yesterday, Yesterday. okay, yes. So um, we decided to adopt a struct log. Uh, I think Einek is giving a talk about this in another room. Is the maintainer core developer. It's extremely cool. Um, also, we 
start having metrics, which, which means uh, finally we know how many 400x errors we receive, um, and we can uh, be more proactive. And another thing is that when you use struct log, you can add like context to your logs, which means you can you can introspect your application in a proper way, and you can know. I mean, you uh, you will be able to know what is happening also in production, and it's something completely different at the end. So the first step was to augment our logs using struct log. Um, the next step like I said before, is to have meaningful metrics, and currently it's something we're working on. Um, uh, it will be related to, um, um, like could be related to answering like simple question, like the number of error that you get on your load balancer, but also something more like related to the number of queries that you get or the speed of your queries. And this is extremely important, otherwise you will feel like blind about your application. <coughs> And because we are running inside GCP, um, we, we don't plan to run like anything. Um, we will use Stackdriver, which is the logging and metric platform offered by uh, Google. The integration with Kubernetes is amazing, actually. Uh, you get everything for free. I mean, it's, it's, it's everything already set. And it's well integrated with if you use struct log or if you use metrics. And all the information, all the metrics and logs from your Kubernetes cluster, they will get directly there. So the future of our software will be more microservices. Uh, we plan to complete the migration to Kubernetes by the end of the year, and we will have a bit better and bigger focus on data. Um, so what do you mean by data? I mean, yes, we can start talking about the hype about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, but uh, there are really two things we are working on at Team Farm. One is uh, fully automated farms, which means removing all the human labor work. So if you remember the movie Matrix with all the machine, um, yes, working on humans, we will do the same, but with plants. And the last thing is, uh, currently we're using Particle. It's a small micro device, which is not really powerful, but it was convenient at the beginning. And the plan is to have in the future, in the farms, uh, edge computing, which means you need to run a computer inside the farm uh, because we want to run machine learning algorithms there. And the goal is to have fully automated farm with fully autonomous farm, and each farm will be able to decide uh, which is the best recipe. Uh, I want to have a more tasty basil, what should I do? So we want to reduce the human control over the farms and to make them more, more smart. Um, also, because like I said at the beginning, we are using zero pesticides, which is really nice, but it's painful. Because there are many diseases uh, which are already, like they are not a problem anymore, but as soon as you start not using uh, pesticides anymore, uh, you will get like uh, like fifty percent of your plants can, e can easily die, um, especially because um, many of the diseases are just brought by humans. So if we reduce also the quantity of human labors, we will also reduce this problem. And also, um, we plan to move to towards a more software-oriented company which means um, we will try to switch from a business model where producing farm is also a part of our business to have a more uh, service-oriented company. Uh, because this is not like producing food, this is also research, uh, improving food quality and many other things. So another thing we're working on right now, and it's our first step towards artificial intelligence, is fighting pests. Uh, especially during the summer, because of um, uh, because the weather is warmer, one of the things that we see is that we have something called shrinkage. So having you start with 100 plants, and then by the end of the four weeks, you just have 50% of them, which is really killing our production. And one way to resolve these issues is again using artificial intelligence and being more smart.
Cool. So thanks. That's everything I had. Um, if you live in Berlin, we are hiring, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that excellent talk. Okay, questions. Who's got a question? Uh, I have a question about energy consumption. If you grow your vegetables outside, you get the sun for free. Here you have to put energy. Did you have some kind of balance, uh, by, uh, balance how much energy you use compared to taking a tractor and going to the field? Yeah, so, yes, that's a good question. Uh, it's hard to say because um, on our side, we can control everything. Um, but it's, if you control like the, if you take into consideration everything, uh, we are much more efficient because we can reuse the water, for example. Uh, light, I mean, energy is not really a problem because, especially in Germany, you can use wind energy, uh, solar energy. So it's, it's more or less for free from you know, the climate change perspective. But um, for example, we, we don't have like fuel consumed because we, we don't move too much compared to uh, traditional farming. So yes, uh, I mean, so far the output is really good from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Good talk. So Thank you basically showed the history of uh, organic growth of startup from technical perspective. And the question is, if you started it today, what would be your main decision changes? Like, would you start from Kubernetes? Would you start from microservices, etc.? And the second question is, uh, no pesticides is good, but what about taste? Do you have a taste matrix or something like that? Thank you. Okay, so to answer the first question, what would I change like from a technical perspective if I would go back? I mean, everything is easier if you consider this, no? Uh, we will make many different d decisions probably. We will probably use Django directly and not using Flask. Uh, we will avoid like using Heroku and we will use like a different platform. We will be uh, like containerized since the beginning. So <coughs> yeah, many things they will be different. Um, and um, what was the second question, sorry? Taste. taste, okay. I'm from Italy and I know something about food taste. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I tried the best herbs ever there. Uh, because the taste of the herbs is connected to their freshness and if you remember like the video, they still have the roots. So when you buy them from the grocery shop, they are like fresh, like but fresh, fresh. You're still alive. So they're super tasty, not just by the taste, but also by the smell. So it's the best quality that you can have, probably. Next. Um, two small questions. First one is you know, whether you chose to go with um, uh, hydroponics or some sort of soil, artificial soil. Uh -huh. And uh, the second one is whether you think you'll be able to match the nutrient density of using organic uh, farming you know, with artificial solutions. Okay. So, uh, so uh, what, have, what you have seen here at hydroponic system. We plan to migrate to aeroponics, which is different, but there is no soil inside, it is just water. And we use, um, we use the water, it's a, it's a ground to grow the plants. Um, one in interesting thing is that we are not bio. Because by definition, we don't have soil, so we cannot define ourselves uh, like a bioproduct, although we don't use pesticides and all these things. So we also need to build like um, a new marketing model for our customers. Um, so to answer your question, yes, um, we plan to increase and to work more on quality. And currently, we're using an hydroponic system, but the future, especially for the fully automated farm, is to be hydroponic. You mean? Uh, well, we control them because we have the fertilizer. So we use three different kinds of fertilizers and we try to minimize the use of fertilizer given the same quality. Uh, so I, I cannot really compare with the organic farms. Hi. Um, yeah, it's Hi. so awesome to see people not just doing another app, but something real. But Thank you. In the start of the talk, you promised to feed the world, and you cannot do it with just basil, right? Uh, you want tomatoes, <laughs> you want potatoes, wheat. What about like real crops? <laughs> so, 
so it's it's really up to you. Uh, as soon as you have a system which works, then it's really up to your fantasy. Um, if you have the system, you can go pretty much wherever you want. Like we use herbs because um, they are more sustainable from an economic perspective. They're easy to be sold to grocery shops and they are more expensive. Uh, so at this phase of our business is the best way. But there are like companies, for example, in Paris, they are growing strawberries inside containers. So it's really up to you. Um, Next question. Hi. Um, I was wondering about the price point. Is it more expensive uh, than the basil that you buy in a plastic <coughs> bag? or And uh, how much? So the price for uh, one herb is 1 euro and 29 cents, I think. And it's more or less comparable to what you find inside the shops. So it's Very not cool. super expensive. Thanks. Yeah. Next. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you wanna, if we wanna implement uh, your farm in another country, for instance in Yemen or this kind of country, can you give us your technical requirement? Sorry. Can you give us your requirement, your technical requirement for implement technical. this kind of farm in not a developed country? What do you mean, technical requirement from which yeah. perspective? If you want to just pop up uh, this kind of farm. It's, it's completely separated from your environment. So as long as you have water and electricity, I mean, you have the fertilizer and the pH controls, it's, 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 then you can put it, it wherever you want. like. Um, uh, ESS station on I don't know, Antarctica or really as long I mean you also need to control the temperature and all these things but it's, it's really unrelated to the place so you can use the same and you can <coughs> use and apply the same strategy to different places Hi uh, yeah Hi. thanks for the talk um, I was just wondering you started by talking about how you're trying to solve world hunger because there's more and more people yes. and you ended by describing your company in a dystopian way comparing it to the matrix which seems kind of weird to me. Sorry? Compared uh, to? Yeah, comparing it to the matrix, which okay. is not necessarily a great example, I okay. think. Um, so I was just wondering, when you're cutting, like one of your goals right now is automating and cutting people off from the production, when we are going to double in size of population, is that really a good goal? Or what, what do you think about it? You mean because then we'll have unemployed people? Maybe. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't know. To me, that's like a false problem. Because at, we, we saw the same before. So uh, the technical revolution, the industrial revolution, uh, they are also happening right now. So you will just get new kind of, uh, of jobs. Uh, you also need to control the farms, operate the farms, uh, maintain the farm, maintaining the farms. So uh, sure, uh, but I don't think it's like a problem at the end. Um. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you throw in a bunch of insects in your farms for pollination. Do you do this kind of stuff? For pollination? Yeah. No. But to fight diseases, yes. <coughs> to fight diseases, we use uh, bugs. Hi. Uh, hello. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, I wonder if uh, you uh, consider like autonomous uh, installations or or your farms uh, must rely on um, reliable internet connection to your uh, cloud services to, uh, to monitor, to run <coughs> actually this farm? Or you consider this like autonomous installation? So each farm is more or less autonomous. Um, as long as it has like a configuration inside, it just keeps running the configuration. Um, of course, you need to have electricity and water. Uh, but yes, it can run for like a week or a couple of weeks uh, without like internet connection. I mean, that, that's also a problem because then you cannot apply all the monitoring and alerting pipeline, like, okay, water is, is not there anymore. So they are not really built with the idea of being completely disconnected from internet. Um, next person. Hey, um, are you planning to release any of the specifics that are used for the hardware in an open source way or in a in a way that people can maybe rebuild or <coughs> build on top of this or build with this? You're talking specifically about the farms, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, that's one of the ideas that we have also inside the company. Also because our business in the future will not be to build the farms. 
Hi, Hi. very nice talk. Uh, my question is regarding all the hardware involved for these farms, and if your company bought some, like, used something out of the box, or if you developed everything. Um, so our farming is expensive, but if you open the bottom container, it's really cheap inside. Like, you, we have many components, but it's something that you can buy, I don't know, in, in the market. It's not something super high tech. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, you, you mentioned that you want to, to, yeah, to save the world. So, so do you have metrics about the sustainability of such system? Like, because you have to provide lights and that looks like a lot of energy to, to grow your plants. So do you have metrics about this? Uh, yes, we have some metrics about this. But when you talk about the sustainability, you mean to produce the farm and then to run the farm or just run the farm? So we have so we have metrics for both actually. I'm not really updated about them, but the thing is, <coughs> energy will not be really a problem. So there are things that are much more important, like water. Uh, I mean, we use like 90% of the water compared to 90% less water compared to uh, normal farms, and that's an issue in many places. Like uh, it's 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 easy to have like low cost or free energy. Water is, is like limited. Good water is like limited. That's a big issue. And we are more, much more concerned about using, in a proper way, water than energy. Another question going back to the beginning slides. You said we need to increase production by 25%, yeah. and waste is up to 50%. So if you do the mass, and if you just reduce waste, it would solve the problem. Yeah, it's the same with the diet. It's just not that easy. I mean, uh, like we know <laughs> the problems, the solutions are there. Apply them is another thing, sadly. Uh, but yes, just redu I mean, there are also many startups working on uh, reducing food waste. Uh, but that's the, the sad reality. Uh, uh, currently, we are not doing our best, and we have different solutions. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, you said that you use AI to um, control and optimize your external parameters like <coughs> pH and uh, water. Not yet. Yeah. That's the future. Okay, that's the future. Yes. And uh, do you plan to do it also for choosing your seeds, or do you uh, do you plan to do any genes manipulations? No, no, no. We we don't. So we use OGM. So we, we don't use like OGM. So uh, from that perspective, it's um, we, we don't plan to apply anything to genes or things like this. But um, inside a farm, we run <coughs> we like we grow different type of crops. So we probably want to use machine learning to find the best combination because that will also help to fight diseases. So we also need to play in that way. Uh, me, I got a question. Sure. The business looks like amazing for a customer perspective, uh -huh. but you say you change it to B2B? Yes. Why? So if I would you love to have one of your farm in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go on Kickstarter and you will look for Infarm, you will see the crowdfunding campaign by the funders. They were going around Berlin teaching people how to grow um, herbs or whatever, tomatoes inside their apartment. And they were going around with a, a caravan and they were teaching people so that that's like their soul, but it didn't work. Um, and as soon as they tried to switch to uh, business to business, so they tried to connect with a grocery shop or shopping markets, um, they had a different feedback. It's, it's just more sustainable. So running a farm inside a grocery shop like Edeka it's just marketing. It's not sustainable from a business perspective. You need to have multiple farms together to run them effectively from uh, like money-wise. So yes, there are different companies working also on that. But running a farm, it's, it's expensive. Like it's, you have daily operation that you need to perform. So sorry for now, I don't have like a farm to sell, to sell you. Hi. Yeah. Sorry, can I just ask a question? Sure. Of your different solutions, change our diet, reduce waste, and use technology, yeah. how, you know, what percentage would you attribute to all of these to be able to solve this world food population problem? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, changing our diet is like inexpensive, right? It's just changing what you put inside our fridge. Um, Again, many things are just changing our habits, uh, which uh, it should be cheap, uh, cheaper somehow, but it's not. Uh, if we don't want to change our uh, like uh, way of living, using technology is probably the best way. Okay. So you're but saying it's hard like, to define like a, a percentage. 
Okay, so you're saying maybe human beings are quite lazy and technology is the answer. It's, it's not <laughs> just, yes, also, but you also need to consider that people from developing countries are growing and they want to behave like Western people. And uh, then you cannot say to them, okay, just try to reduce waste or change our diet. They will say, I don't care. You spent like the last 50 years doing the same. Now it's my time. Sure. Uh, related to the last uh, uh, topic, what about policy? I mean, you didn't, like policy is pretty important, but it's not in the list here, so. And policy can drive technology, can change our diet, can reduce waste, and can help with all these things. Policy, you mean regulation coming from the nations? You can call it that, yeah, but. Do we want to talk about the Paris Agreement no, or no. something like this? <laughs> no, but I think it's been, it's. Uh, yeah, it could be to maybe to one day before the end of the world. I don't know, I, I don't trust regulation so much. I mean, it can be helpful, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, <coughs> do you think that these solutions might increase population growth even further and make the problem worse? Because as humans, it's our nature to sort of push things to the limit. And, and yeah, sure, I mean, uh, sure, 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 sure. So you're going to stop? Sure. <laughs> I heard this like concern. Yes, yes. You can reduce like food production, and then we'll see. Uh, We've got time for one more question, and so... Hi. Um, I have a last question about, well, going back to the tooling, a bit more Pythonic. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that uh, you, you moved to using more uh, linters, for instance. And in that sense, did you start from scratch, or did you enhance what you had? And if so, what was basically your, what would be your best practice and how to go for that? And if you didn't fall into the fallacy of pleasing the linters too much, because in the end you want to have like all green. I do like to have all green actually. <laughs> so it's also pleasing myself. Um, but so uh, I wasn't at the company at the time, but from, from what I heard, um, yes, they, they, they did all this part uh, with the linters, uh, considering the whole code base. So someone spent like a week or maybe two and applied the linters until everything was green. Um, if you have a very large code base, probably it's not the best practice. Um, maybe you can just apply the linters to the new changes. That's a way. Um, but I think that in our case, the changes weren't so big and it was okay. Okay, thank you very much. Can you please give a warm round of applause Thank to you. Christian? Thank you.